helpful to have your Bibles open at this 15th chapter of Luke, which is perhaps one of the best known and contains one of the best loved parables, which we didn't actually read this morning, the parable of the prodigal son. And there's a story there that finds an echo, I think, in hearts all around the world. And there's one time that I heard that story, or rather that I saw that story, that I will never forget. It's cut right into my heart, because one night, late at night, we went down into the rice fields to a place where there was a railway station. And you wouldn't have known that there were any signs of civilization apart from the rice fields all around, but there, back in amongst the trees, were village after village after village. And there on the railway station, the Javanese church had converted one of the platforms into a stage. The lamps were oil lamps, and the microphones were made out of old loudspeakers that had been taken out of disused radios, and you might have laughed. But there for two or three hours, because time doesn't matter in the beautiful East, there they enacted the story of the prodigal son right in the heart of villages that were wholly given over to superstition, animism, and Islam. And there they told the story of a father's burning, yearning love for his son. You didn't actually get right through the play because a train came in, puffing away in the middle. No bother, we just get up onto the other platform. And then the train goes out and the story went on. But do you know, out of that night, that story played before their eyes and then the preacher standing up and expounding that here is a God who loves and longs for a lost world. That from that night, it was never repeated. Village after village, till 27 of those villages responded and longed to hear the gospel of this God who cared. Because it cut right through that tropical night. Here was a story that was so different from what they'd heard from Islam, of a God that was cold and distant and icy, that spoke of rules and regulations and offered a sword. So different from the God that they knew at the back of their animistic belief. Cut off from them by evil spirits and malevolent forces. A God who cared. A God who was like a loving father longing to draw his lost son back to him. That parable did so much. Perhaps it's spoken to our heart. And yet, in fact, that parable of the prodigal son here in chapter 15 is a part of a greater parable. Because you see in verse 3, Luke says that Jesus told them this parable. As if to say that these three stories that you read in this chapter, the story of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son, or the lost sons, was really just one parable in three pictures and the theme of it is one and the theme is that of the seeking and saving grace of a loving God the loving yearning heart that God has for sinners men who are lost like that chicken in the pit I wanted us just to look simply at two things this morning first of all what was it that made Jesus tell this parable on this occasion And then secondly, what was it that the parable really sought to illustrate? First of all, then, what was it that made Jesus tell the parable in the first place or in this particular instance? And I think you have the answer to that in part when you look at the last two verses of chapter 14, or the last half, rather, of the last verse of chapter 14, and the first two verses of chapter 15. Because it says there that Jesus ended up his other teaching in chapter 14 by saying, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And then it goes on to say, Now the tax collectors and the sinners were all drawing near to hear. But the following verse says, The Pharisees and the scribes, far from drawing near in that sense to really hear what Jesus was saying, 
they looked at the sinners drawing near to Jesus and they said, this man receives sinners. And he eats with them. Now the point in comparing those two voices is just this. Jesus had been outlining there as we were seeing last week at the end of chapter 14 what it really meant to be a Christian. What it really meant to have faith in God. And he was pointing out that to be a disciple, to be Christ's, means that you have a vital, living, personal relationship with Christ which takes precedence over every other relationship. It takes priority over every other and indeed every relationship in life, whether it's relationship to your nearest and dearest, or your relationship to yourself, or to the things that you possess. And the significant thing that I think comes out in these two verses around the centre here is just this, that this crucial truth produced a twofold response. On the one hand, the ordinary open-minded men responded to the story of Christ and his love and were drawn to him, drawn to desire that relationship with God. But on the other hand, it was those who prided themselves in being religious, those who had almost been inoculated against the very truth of God by their religion, who repelled by what Jesus said, and all they could do was look on those who responded with an attitude of acid cynicism and criticism. And the reason why they were repelled was because they had substituted a kind of religion for this fundamental living relationship with God. They had substituted duty for devotion, a ritual performance for a personal walk with God. You will recall, of course, that the chapters leading up to this chapter have been very solemnizing, very severe. And the reason why they were severe is that they grew out of this fierce confrontation that Jesus had with the scribes and the Pharisees and their own particular brand of religiosity. For no matter how zealous and hyperactive they were in the service of God, in the public performance of their religious duties, the truth was that their inner lives were a stench to the nostrils of God. He said, your whited sepulchres, dead men's bones, corpses lie within. And the fact of the matter was that their hearts were as dead and unresponsive and insensitive to the heart of God as a corpse is to the touch. Yes, maybe they were active in God's house. Maybe they were always there at the worship. Maybe their prayers were more earnest than anybody else's. Maybe they put more in the collection than anybody else. But where it mattered most of all, their relationship to God, they were dead. There was nothing there. And that's the reason why to them it was incomprehensible that God and his son Jesus Christ should be putting out his arms to receive those who were sinful, those who stumbled and fell, because they had no notion of what the heart of God was like. And of course, at the end of this chapter, Jesus, as it were, holds up the mirror to them, so that they can see themselves when he speaks about the elder son. And it's a frightful and a repulsive picture. You've got it there in verse 25. When that boy who comes back to his father is there rejoicing and the father's heart is leaping for joy, it says in verse 25, the elder son was in the field and as he came and drew near to the house and heard music and dancing, he called one of the servants and asked what it meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he's received him safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in, even though, as you read on, the father came out and entreated that boy. Here he was, and there they were as the scribes and the Pharisees, active in God's work, as it were, Diligent in their duty, punctilious in their faithfulness. 
and yet so totally dead, so totally out of touch with the Father, that they didn't understand how the Father loved that lost boy. In fact, he was so self-satisfied that he was utterly callous and hardened towards his brother. Outwardly a religious conformist, and yet inwardly, living in a far country, feeding on the pig swill of his own righteousness. And you see, the real problem in the heart of that elder son, and the real problem in the heart of the Pharisees was that they had a wrong concept of God. They were like the man who buried his talent and said, I knew that you were a hard man. And what they didn't know and what the Pharisees didn't understand is that God is a loving Father. And consequently they could not share the joy at the rescue of a lost sheep. They were so bent on producing their own kind of self-righteousness to offer up to God. They were thinking that it's what I do that makes me acceptable to God. And the idea that Christ should be God's son, but at the same time should receive sinners and eat with them. These things to them were mutually exclusive. And what they didn't know, and what Jesus wanted to show them, and what Jesus longs to show us, is that God is not a hard taskmaster. He doesn't sit there in icy indifference, but he's a loving father who yearns that we might come back to him, who waits to see us turn and goes running towards us. You see, they've missed that fundamental truth that's written there right in those early pages of Genesis when the Lord God walked in the garden and said to Adam, Where art thou? fundamental truth of the gospel is that that God is still crying out today to a lost world where are you? he's longing he's yearning crying for a lost humanity and you see that's why the gospel is good news that's what thrilled my soul as a missionary there that night as I saw the story of the prodigal son so graphically portrayed. Here is God so loving the world that he gives his only son. Here is the gospel of Christ dying to save the lost. The good shepherd laying down his life for the sheep. The son of man coming to seek and save that which is lost. And you see there's an infinity of difference and distance between that and what the world understands by religion. You see, religion is bad news. Religion is man trying to do something of his own accord, manufacturing some kind of acceptability that he presents to God in the hopes that God may receive him. And that's bad news. But the gospel is good news. For it is God reaching down to where you and I are and putting his arms of love around about us and taking us up and laying us upon his shoulders and rejoicing. Not that we are sinless, but rather that we have come to repentance. It is that that makes his heart leap for joy. See, I think there's a vital truth that we dare not miss because if we miss it, we misunderstand not just our own understanding of the gospel but the whole world and the understanding of the meaning of the truth of God. And the vital truth is this, that the initiative for salvation is with God. It is grounded in Him. And in his character, it is not grounded in you or me or anything that you and I can produce and offer to God. It's nothing of what I am or what I do. 
It doesn't matter what church I belong to or how often I come to the worship in a sense. It isn't the office that I happen to hold in the congregation or the esteem that I happen to hold in ecclesiastical circles. That has nothing to do with that which secures my eternal salvation. All the ground of your salvation, all the ground of my acceptance is in God and his grace. It is his initiative, his saving righteousness, his reaching out to me and lifting me up out of the miry pit and setting my feet upon a rock and putting a new song in my mouth. And you see, that just cuts across. It cuts across all human understanding of religion. It cuts across the grain of human pride. The Pharisee here thought he was doing well as he tried to reach up to God with his good works and his striving. The Muslim in Indonesia looks to his regular prayer cycle, his almsgiving, his fasting, his going to Mecca if he can. He looks to all these things. Hopefully God will be merciful and receive his good works. Or the Thai Buddhist goes through the endless cycle of reincarnation, giving away his money, giving food to the priest, saying his prayers in the hopes that perhaps he will earn a better incarnation. Or the animist burns his incense and makes his offerings, trying to ward off the evil eye and divert the malevolent spirits of the universe. But you see, the gospel cuts across all of that. Because all these things are based on a wrong concept of God. You cannot reach up to the unreachable. God's holiness is so holy and so other that there is no way anything I can manufacture that could be the ground of my acceptance. God says, I'm sorry, but all your good works are like filthy rags. They belong to the pit. But the truth here is that God is a loving Father. And while he cannot and while he will not accept my acts of righteousness as a ground for salvation, he can and he will and he has in the righteousness of Christ accepted us. For God commends his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I was once asked, what is it that makes you go into a country where other people have another religion? How do you justify going there? That's the answer. These people have no understanding of God. They know nothing of the Father's love. Little wonder that this story of the returning son of the loving Father is such an effective missionary message. Let's look secondly at more closely, although, albeit more briefly, at the three pictures that our Lord presents here. The first picture, of course, is the familiar one of the shepherd and the sheep, and I'm sure from Sunday school days all of us have seen the pictures that many an artist has drawn that beautiful hymn, which I had hoped perhaps the choir might have sung this morning, but I didn't relay that, so I am forgiven, I trust. There were ninety and nine that safely lay in the shelter of the fold, but one was out on the hills away, far off from the gates of gold. And then that hymn goes on, and as our Lord himself must have been thinking of the cross, even as he spoke of the story of the shepherd going out to find that lost sheep, but none of the ransomed ever knew how deep where the waters crossed, nor how dark was the night that our Lord passed through ere he found that sheep that was lost. Such a beautiful picture there in verses 3 to 7. Then the second picture is the picture of the woman searching for the coins. She'd lost a coin perhaps worth a day's wage and perhaps you may wonder why she was so 
desperate to find it. Well, of course, we're all desperate to find a day's wage. And yet the joy with which she found it and rejoiced with her neighbours perhaps indicates that it may have been worth to her far more than a day's wage. Some commentators think that perhaps it was a coin that belonged to a little frontlet that she wore. Rather like the the ring that you put on your finger when you get engaged or married. And if you've ever lost a stone out of your engagement ring, ladies only of course, then you will know how this woman felt and how much it mattered to her. And how diligently she sought, how concerned she was. She turned over every piece of dust, as it were, on the mud floor to find that missing, valuable coin. Then that third picture of the lost boy or the lost boys. For the older son, despite all his outward appearances, was even far more lost, in a sense, than in a far country because he was out of touch with his father's heart. Now, there are two things here, I think, that Jesus was trying clearly to illustrate, first of all, how he sees men and women as lost before God, and then secondly, how he knows that God in his love longs and searches and rejoices when he finds the lost. These four illustrations that we've got here, in a sense, are perhaps not watertight. Perhaps they reflect various aspects of lostness that we all experience. The sheep lost simply because it's trying to gratify itself going from one clump of grass to another. Not looking to the right, not looking to the left, not thinking where this kind of lifestyle is taking it. Not aware of the dangers until suddenly it wakes up to the fact that it's lost and it doesn't know the way back. Lost through its own stupidity and thoughtlessness. And Jesus sees us like that. And then there's the coin which could hardly be accused of straying. It just rolled away. Perhaps the coin itself wasn't responsible for rolling away. It was perhaps through the carelessness and the neglect of someone else. And maybe that speaks to us who have the commission to preach the gospel of Christ and witness for him. Lost through carelessness and neglect. And then there's the younger son lost out of rebellion, imagining that if only he could get away from the restraints of home, somehow he would really begin to live. That's in the heart of man too, this desire to break away from the father's house, fondly imagining that if only we could get out from under God, we would have all the liberty we would want. We could eat and drink and be merry. And throw off all restraint. The Bible says there is a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof is the way of death. And God, as the Creator, has put certain rules and regulations and principles into this universe. And Adam broke those principles, but God has put them there and has expounded them to us in His Word, not to bind us. Not to keep us in bondage, but to keep us in safety. To keep us in a living, joyful relationship with God. But if you disregard that word of God, then you disregard it at your peril. And you find yourself like this young man found himself. In a famine. Without hope. Looking hungrily at pig's food because that's where rebellion against God and his word will bring you and do you and I look out upon this world around about us and this country in which we are living and say yes that's precisely what we see on every hand men and women in a famine with no hope sitting by the pig trough There's that fourth picture of lostness. To me it's more frightening than all the others. The lostness of that elder son. Frightening because he didn't know that he was lost. He didn't realize that he was really far away from his father. 
He was religiously dutiful. But his heart was far from God. I wonder if it's possible that we can substitute some special homemade brand of evangelical piety. Divorced from the word of God that is injected into our system in such a way that it immunizes us against the truth, the vital fundamental truth of what it means to walk in close fellowship with God and obedience to his word till we find ourselves in a far country. Well, that is how our Lord portrays the lost. Lost through stupidity, lost through carelessness, lost through willful rebellion, and perhaps lost by being immunized towards a heart relationship with God with a dose of so-called religion which bears no relationship to God as revealed in his word. But then the other side of the picture that Jesus portrays in these parables is that of a God yearning and searching for the lost. You know, when Jesus looked at Jerusalem, he wept and said, Oh, Jerusalem. Oh, Jerusalem, how often would I have gathered your children together as a chicken gathers her brood under her wings, and you would not. And when Jesus looked on the multitudes with the compassion of his Father's heart, it says he had compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd, harassed and helpless. And Jesus knew that the Father had sent him into the world to seek and to save such. And that is why he received sinners and ate with them. And that's why if you and I are in any way in touch with the heart of God, we cannot be unmoved by the lost world in which we live. It can never be a matter of indifference that there are millions across the face of this world who have a totally wrong concept of God, who know nothing of that love that he has, who are still deceived into thinking that they must do something to earn his love and to merit his salvation. God does not wish that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Do you see the goodness and the love of God here? Sometimes people will say that God is unjust and unloving, if he condemns anyone to hell. But don't you see that God himself in his own son has gone into the very pit of hell? He's poured out all his love. He cannot pour out any more. For he did not withhold his only son. Look at the picture in verse 20 of the father. As the boy is turning back and running towards his father, it says in verse 20, but while he was yet at a distance, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. No sooner has the son turned, no sooner is it apparent that he's coming back than the father He doesn't sit there like some distant icy force. But with all the love of his heart, runs to wrap his arms around his boy. (coughs) 
or the grace of God. The love of God. For indeed it is He who turns us back. You know that hymn, I sought the Lord, and afterward I knew He moved my soul to seek Him, seeking me. It was not I that found, O Saviour, true. No, I was found, was found of Thee. I wonder how God's word finds me this morning. Does it find me running towards him, crying from the very depths of my heart, Oh, Father, be merciful to me. I'm a sinner. I'm not worth calling your son. Does it find me sensing the heartbeat of God for a lost world? Does it find me hearing him say, Whom shall I send and who will go for me? And is there in my heart that response that says, Lord, here am I. Send me. Or is there a desperate coldness to God's word? Do I have the sickness of the elder son does it make me search my heart shall we pray <coughs> Lord we stand amazed at the love that Jesus offers. We pray, Lord, that that love may melt us down, not to produce an emotional response, but to make our wills conform to your will, that we may truly say, Here am I, Lord. Send me to do your will. For Jesus' sake. Amen.